Hi, I'm Davy Jones. Here's what some of my friends are saying about the hot new series, Meet the Royals, on a and &E. Hello, I'm Prince Andrew. Remember me? As you know, I'm a man's man. And real men watch Meet the Royals. Meet the Royals, next on a and &E. The Royals are coming to America. Here they come, walking down the street. They get the funniest looks from everyone they meet. Hey, hey, meet the Royals, nothing like you and me. A loaded with power and money, and chased by the paparazzi. Hey, hey, meet the Royals, hey, hey, meet the Royals. Hey, Prince William, is this any way to prepare for the crown? Chopping wood? Cutting up a chicken? Scouring the loo? Oh, dear. Hey, hey, Davy Jones here. Have you ever wondered what's in a prince's job description? Now, I'll wager you never dreamed it involved cooking and cleaning. Well, welcome to Meet the Royals, where we take you inside the palace for a look at what blue-blooded life is really like. The preparation, the protocol, and the occasional polishing of a toilet bowl. Sometimes it's a royal pain, even if you're a prince named Wills, destined to become King of England. I think every indication is that William is the man for the job. He's dashing, he's glamorous, he's charming. And I think that he himself will, in due course, become a bigger star than his mother. He may look like his mother, but he has the character of his father. His drawing power is incredible. I think partly because he appears so normal and so down to earth. He actually would prefer to be an ordinary guy who could lead an ordinary life. Sit back and behold the bouncing babe, all grown up and ready for action. A&E presents William, the reluctant prince, on Meet the Royals. June 21st, 2003. Guests arrive for the private celebration of Prince William's 21st birthday at Windsor Castle. And yes, that is a man in a lion suit. William decided he didn't want a staid party, he wanted a really fun party. So he chose an African theme, and all the guests came in these really wild clothes. Um, William himself wore a long loincloth, the Queen was dressed as the Queen of Swaziland. I mean, it was, it was quite far out for Windsor Castle. But that's what we've come to expect with William. He follows the rules, but with his own personal twist. Now in college at St. Andrews in Scotland, William is dropping tantalizing hints about his future and what type of king he will become. Whatever path he chooses, it will bear the distinctive William stamp. Wills has been blazing a trail all his life, and his flair for going his own way began, surprisingly, in a place bound by tradition. Exclusive Eton College has been catering to Britain's upper crust for more than 500 years. 19 British prime ministers count themselves Old Etonians. But no heir apparent ever attended until William started in 1995. This is where he spent most of his teen years, boarding with 50 other boys in Manor House. Unlike his father, who hated boarding school, William loved Eton. Maybe because he was a better student than Dad. His exam results were the best achieved by a member of the royal family since they started taking public exams 33 years ago. In between Shakespeare and Spanish, Wills was competitive. The prince spent time kicking around the soccer field for his house team. And William, who inherited Princess Diana's swimming skills, also played a mean game of water polo. And this is what he wore to class, what the boys called the penguin suit. Wills was allowed to wear whatever color vest he chose, even purple, because he was a prefect, top dog among the boys. Being a prefect didn't rule William out of cooking duty, and sometimes it got ugly. Welcome to Cooking with the Future King. Watch as Prince William turns a respectable paella into a royal mess. I'm just following the orders there. <laughs> it usually comes late. Last week was pretty bad, so 
<laughs> we managed to put double the amount of sauce into the pan and we had condensed milk instead of a, a lightly condensed milk, but it all went horribly wrong. No, no, not the sauce, not the sauce. <laughs> well, there you have it, chicken a la Prince. Thanks for watching Cooking with the Future King. Despite his cooking fiascos, Wills graduated in June 2000 and soon after gave a rare press conference thanking journalists for leaving him alone at school. The whole of Eton made a real big difference with everyone not trying to sort of snap a picture every time I was walking around the streets. And I hope it just continues for Harry as well while he's there. And then William surprised everyone. Instead of going straight to college, he told the press he was taking a year off and spending part of his royal gap year with a volunteer service organization in remote Patagonia, Chile. I wanted to do something constructive for my gap year rather than, I mean, uh, I could do quite a lot of work, but I thought this was a, a bit more of a way of um, making, uh, trying to help people out and meet a whole range of different people. To raise money for the trip, William organized a sponsored water polo match. In the end, he raked in $8,000 without any help from dear old dad. Or so he said. I raised myself about five and a half thousand pounds. And did your father chip in as well? Um, you might have helped slightly. <laughs> Not very much, though. I chip in all the bloody time. <laughs> Excuse me, but did Prince Charles just make a joke? Hey, hey, let's see that again. And did your father chip in as well? Um, you might have helped slightly. <laughs> Not very much, though. I chip in all the bloody time. <laughs> oh, he did. Brilliant. William allowed a camera crew to follow him on part of his trip, giving the world a rare glimpse of the young man in some very unregal circumstances. Like practicing his high school Spanish. Hi, I'm Will. Hola, me, me amo Guillermo. Polishing the cooking skills he picked up at Eton. Now I'm going to feed it to my father till he's sick, <laughs> so he can see what we went through and slogging through some early morning chores. Would you be aware what time it is? Got up at 6.15. This was the image that made the biggest impression. The future King of England scrubbing the toilet. Now that's what I call a throne. I mean, there's never been photographs of a, of a future king cleaning a lavatory before. I think people were surprised. I mean, <laughs> you don't, I mean, why would anyone want to clean the loo anyway, let alone be photographed doing it? But I think the ordinary person is the reality with William. He actually wants to have a good time, be with his friends, uh, and be one of them. We actually got a talk of... Um, Williams come in, don't call him Your Majesty, and don't call him Sir, just call him Will. Thank you very, very much. To be honest, I wasn't that bothered, really. So, it's just, he's just a person, isn't he? He's no, nothing, oh yeah, he's been born into the family, but that's all it is. I don't like being treated any different at all. I don't like special treatment at all, um, which is why I just, I, I think I get along with these guys so well as well. I hope I don't come across as someone who's just trying to be treated differently by the staff when they all treat me the same, the locals treat me the same. And I just, I love being, having no restrictions, you know. There's no one out here chasing me around or anything, it's brilliant. Will's grandfather, Prince Philip, actually criticized him for acting a bit too lowbrow. But local school children had no trouble at all adjusting to ordinary Will's. When you catch the ball, you say, my name is, my name is Will. I am a wombat. And then you try and make a noise that a wombat makes. You turn around, that's what it's all about. And the girls didn't seem to mind the approachable prince either. And for any of you people who are in a bit of a, a bit of a mood for love, this song is for you. It was more the older girls, which is quite strange, isn't it? That were like, oh my god, it's William, but he's not my type anyway. <laughs> William was the clown of the group and not afraid to monkey around a bit. He also displayed the common touch his mother, Princess Diana, was famous for. 
William's like one of the lads. Like he gets involved with everyone. Really friendly. He, he's like a lad. You know what I mean? But you just have a laugh at them. And he walks out of this competition, head held low, not very happy. <laughs> He was just, like, a, a good friend. Like, he'd talk to him about anything. And, like, he'd be telling me, like, if he was born and his dad. And then later on, you'd realise he was talking to Prince Charles. It's just weird things like that. You don't click on at first. The trip to Chile was a welcome change for William, but only a temporary one. Soon, he would return to face the London media and the spotlight that has been shining on him since the day he was born. tomorrow. Hey, hey, welcome back to Meet the Royals here on a and When it comes to titles, the Windsors have them in bucketfuls. Prince William's full title is His Royal Highness Prince William Arthur Philip Lewis, Windsor of Wales. Now, when he turned 18, he got his own coat of arms, complete with waving lions, a unicorn in chains, and a heart with knockers. <laughs> the perfect gift, really. The man who designs the royal crest also has a brilliant title, the Garter Principal King of Arms. Sounds good, yeah? But the pay is bloody awful. The poor fella's only on about $79 a year, but don't worry, it's all right. He's got a day job. <laughs> These royals, they drive a hard bargain. The life of a prince seems like a fairy tale. But despite the glitz, Prince William faced more than his share of sadness. His childhood was rocked by his parents' bitter fighting. And he had the added pressure of being a celebrity from the day he was born. William was born here at St. Mary's Hospital in London in 1982, on June 21st, the longest day of the year. Certainly the longest day for Diana because she'd arrived at the hospital very early in the morning, soon after dawn, and she spent the entire day in labor. Crowds waited for news of the first royal prince to be born in a hospital rather than a palace. The baby was born at nine in the evening. His father, Charles, was the first prince to be present at the birth of his child. May we see your son, your royal highness? Just one day old, the tiny Prince William went home to a doting mum. Many people would imagine that royal babies spend more time with nannies and bodyguards than with their parents, but in Diana's case, that wasn't true. She was a very hands-on mother. She was a very doting mother, and she wanted to be the main figure in her children's lives. The couple went to Australia and New Zealand in March 1983. Taking the prince was a complete break with tradition. It just wasn't done, but Charles and Diana did it anyway. There was much debate before the trip about whether he should go and whether he shouldn't, but I think that she was so determined that she wasn't going to leave him that, you know, she won. When Diana paraded him for us, I think it was in Wellington, uh, it was a wonderful occasion because there he crawled. Diana was so proud, and that's where we first heard Prince Charles call him Wills. <laughs> In England, the family lived in London's Kensington Palace, occasionally showing off their son to photographers. Even as a toddler, he was Prince William, superstar and fashion plate. They came in with, with little William, and he was all dressed up in a navy blue padded all-in-one suit that had ABC written on it. And he was very blonde and, and looked very different from, from a few months before. And I remember it sort of started to trend for those baby suits. You know, this poor child, even at that age, was a fashion trendsetter. Dad! Dad! Camera. Camera, that's right. Like most toddlers, William thought the cameras were pretty cool. He just started to talk, and uh, amazingly, uh, he was very interested in the, in the cameraman, uh, and he was looking in the camera, and the cameraman was showing him the pictures. But the most striking thing about that day was William scratched his head with his left hand, which prompted a very, very sharp-eyed reporter at the Sun to say, I bet you he's left-handed. Royal Flash! 
Prince left-handed. Left-handed Wills went to nursery school in London's Notting Hill. It was another break with royal tradition. Charles had been educated by a governess until the age of eight. Here, William ran into something most three-year-olds don't have to deal with, bad press. We did christen him Billy Basher in the media because uh, there were various stories about William roughing up girls at school and saying, I'll put you in my jail or I'll send you to the tower, stories like that. But one intrepid reporter rushed to sweet William's defense, turning up hard evidence that cleared the prince's name. I've seen the school reports, and he was noted as being a very thoughtful and kind child um, with a sense of fun. The royals, joined by Prince Harry in 1984, looked like a perfectly normal family with a couple of rambunctious boys. But behind the scenes, the fairy tale marriage was disintegrating. Tabloids reported that Prince Charles had rekindled his affair with Camilla Parker Bowles, who he'd known since 1972. And the rumors were true. When it started to go wrong, publicly, they, they behaved perfectly. It was only the rumors you heard. She was having an affair with this person, and Prince Charles was seeing Camilla again. And, and, and you didn't really want to believe it, because publicly, they, they, they were putting on a great show. Charles had moved to Highgrove House, the home he'd bought before he married. Meanwhile, Princess Diana continued to live at Kensington Palace with the children. The princes saw less and less of their father. Diana would come down to Highgrove and take the boys to bed so that Charles, who was supposed to be seeing them, didn't get close to them. She would alter weekend arrangements so that uh, Charles was supposed to be seeing me, didn't get to see them. And after a bit, he got used to this, and he was effectively pushed out of parenting his own children. And Diana's overt displays of affection made Charles look like a cold fish. Take this reunion with the boys after an official tour. She arrived on the yacht and sort of dismissed all the protocol and then just flung a hat off and ran down the deck because she saw her boys and they were there hugging each other like they hadn't seen each other for years. Of course, there was press bias as well. People saw the picture of Diana cuddling her boys, but not the one that followed where Charles is just as affectionate. Harry and William are very, very close to their father. And it's a myth that they never, that they ever weren't. It's just that Diana used the children as, as a means of irritating her husband by taking them away, so it looked like Charles wasn't a caring father. Soon, the boys were living two lives, tugged between their traditional father and more modern mom. The time that William and Harry spent with their dad has been um, more of a traditional time. You know, the, the, the sort of pursuits that you associate with the royal family, the hunting, the shooting, and the fishing, the country ways. Time spent with Diana was totally different. She took the boys to theme parks and fast food restaurants, worlds away from the palace. One of these outings led to another confrontation between young William and the media. On a skiing holiday to Austria in 1991, William was humiliated by the press. William and Harry were both learning to ski, and they were still sort of fairly novice at it at that stage. And we were on the nursery slopes. We were allowed to photograph them for 10 minutes, going up and down, up and down. Harry took to it immediately. He fell over, he fell over, he got up, he got up. He carried on, smiled, and was skiing within a day, I think, of starting his first lesson. Every time William fell over, he was moaning, and he was wimpy, and he was crying, and his policeman was trying to console him, and there was headlines, Willie the Wimp. Only eight years old, William was crushed. But there was worse to come. Oh, go on, Charles, you've got to talk to him. He is all right, all right. I, I'm not one to shirk my parental responsibilities. Um, what's his name again? Will. Nice. A satirical TV series called Spitting Image made fun of Charles, Diana, and their kids. Charles was played as cold and old-fashioned. William was an obnoxious brat. Um, Will 
Jones, old chap. Uh, your old Peter wants to have a talk with you. Oh, eat my shorts, man. I'm on level seven of a Transformazoid attack. Sassy. That reminds me. I want a hundred quid for some new trainers, innit? A hundred pints for some pencils? Yeah, the Reeboks, man. They're, like, really bad. Well, if they're bad, then why do you want them? Smashing. Such negative portrayals hardened William's dislike of the media. And it only grew as he saw his mother chased by relentless paparazzi. There have been some horrendous scenes in the street in resorts like Lech in Austria where um, Italian and French paparazzi would descend on the children and start blazing away within inches of their noses. You started to see it spill over into the boys, you know, they were getting, they'd start shouting out, you know, I remember um, one isn't where William was shouting out from the hotel, leave my mummy alone. Uh, Most members of the royal family hate the media. They hide it very well, but they don't like the fact that they under, live under such scrutiny. I don't blame them. I mean, it's a horrendous life, but that's the deal. But over the years, Will's warmed up to the cameras. A little. On another trip to the mountains, he actually posed for a photo op. Nice yeah, it's good fun, thanks. <laughs> oh, yes, so nice. He clearly was more comfortable than he's ever been before in the presence of the cameras. And I think we saw there something of a turning point in terms of his relationship with the media. William saw his mother being chased down the street. I mean, he witnessed her horror and her fear and her loathing of, of being followed all the time. But he knows that's his destiny, and, and he's going to do it to the best of his ability. You're an idiot. Get this on camera. Ah! You forgot your boots. Oh, my God. <laughs> that's another classic. Yeah, you borrow my ones at Marcus got. That's just about the stupidest thing I could have done. I've got a headache. I need to get rid of it fast. The moment of choice. Delicious, crispy, not your usual fruit and cereal bar. New Oatmeal Crisp Fruit and Cereal Bars. It's the cereal bar with the cereal crunch. When we saw... At Philip Morris USA, we understand that people want to know what actions we're taking on important tobacco issues. We'd like to show you some of what we're doing. We voluntarily removed our ads from the back covers of all magazines and significantly reduced our magazine advertising. And we continue to be the major sponsor of the WeCard program that trains clerks to check for ID to help prevent kids from buying cigarettes. To date, over 900,000 WeCard training and resource kits have been distributed to retailers nationwide. And on our website, you can access the Parent Resource Center that offers practical information and advice from experts on how parents can talk to their kids about not smoking. You'll also find information on the serious health effects of smoking and links to sites that can help smokers quit. For more information, visit philipmorrisusa.com or call for a printed copy of excerpts from our website. It's Palace P's and Q's, helping you mind your royal manners. We're dealing with a very touchy subject today, touching the Queen. Our own etiquette queen, Victoria Mather, says that that's rather bad form. Total no no. The Prime Minister of Australia um, touched her round the waist. Absolute furore about it. I was amazed. But really, really, I mean, he took a, put his hand round her waist to guide her through a crowd. You do not touch the Queen. You actually don't. That considered to be appallingly familiar. Well, what if she's falling down? Can I at least lend her a hand? Can... Well, it may be in absurdly <laughs> extreme circumstances, but hopefully um, she'd have her own staff to do that. If the Queen doesn't fall. What about shaking hands? Shaking hands okay? Is that all right? Yes, you, you can shake her by the hand. But you really should only shake her by two fingers. You're not supposed to do sort of incredible bare handshake like that and wring her by the hand. She's got to shake hands with another hundred people woman you know oh yeah 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 poor queenie oh what a shame oh let's all feel bad for her shall we i'm feeling bad right now in the early 1990s the tabloids had a steady stream of stories from charles and diana as their relationship took a turn for the worse william and the world watched his parents marriage fall apart on the front page 
August 1992, the first trouble, a secretly recorded phone conversation between Diana and her friend James Gilby lands in the tabloids. On the tape, Diana hints at infidelities and complains incessantly about Charles and the royal family. Watching the scandal unfold, 11-year-old William was heartsick. William began to understand it and used to say, well, why are you crying, Mummy? And, why, and then he'd be cross with his father and saying, why are you making Mummy cry? Soon afterwards, another blow. Diana, her true story, hit the bookstores, making Diana's case against the royal family. The war was out in the open. Two sorts of information were coming out, one from Diana, the other from Charles's side, and somewhere in between the two was the truth. Charles thought Diana was using the children as a weapon in the war between them. Finally, Diana pushed him too far. Prince Charles was hosting a um, shooting party at Sandringham House, and Diana was supposed to host it with him. About a week before, Princess Diana rang up and said, I'm not coming. And Prince Charles said, well, in that case, if you're not coming, send the boys. And she said, oh, they're not coming either. And Prince Charles was absolutely horrified. She stuck to her word, and then Prince Charles ordered the, uh, the separation. In December 1992, the royal couple formally separated. The news was a shock to the world. Things soon got even uglier. Transcripts of a telephone conversation between Prince Charles and Camilla Parker Bowles hit the papers. The following year, Charles publicly admitted his adultery. See that his mother and father's life appearing in every newspaper, every television in the world. And it was. I mean, those interviews were paraded worldwide. And uh, wherever he went, he's gone on holiday in America, shooting with his friends. It must have been discussed at great length. Very, very difficult for a young man. Charles and Diana tried to stay civil for the boys. When 13-year-old William started at Eton, they even managed a show of parental unity. Diana was very influential in choosing Eton. That's where her father had been, where her brother had been, and Eton is just across the river from Windsor Castle. Windsor Castle is walking distance for William. On the day William arrived, there was a big press gallery put up outside the house, and just hundreds of photographers and cameramen everywhere. The press had to get their pictures of William at Eton during his first two days. After that, they agreed to keep their distance, and William was able to settle into life away from the cameras. And what does any teenager want to do as soon as his parents are out the door? Party. But it's tricky to party when you're a prince. Soon after he arrived at Eton, William wanted to hit the popular Toffs Ball, the hottest ticket in London. The London balls were very, very popular for the people in the first year. They were, they were you know, very good fun at the time. We had an inkling that someone was coming along that was not your average um, person um, when the, the bomb squad arrived. But it wasn't until about 15 minutes before the party actually opened that we were told that um, Prince William was going to be coming. Word got out. Photographers crowded the area, hoping to spot Prince William surrounded by bodyguards. But the game of Where's William flopped. The prince just blended in with the rest of the crowd. William got his way and went to the Toffs Ball. And of course, there were lots of young girls claiming they kissed him. Word got around that the ball's organizer, Justin Etson, had taken photos of William kissing girls at the ball. It was a royal scandal in the making. A teenage boy kissing girls. Shocking. The palace asked Etson to deep six the incriminating photos. I suppose if the pictures had been released to the press, um, they would have been slightly disappointed because there was no big, big expose of, you know, Prince William in an intimate um, situation. William, at just 13, was a teen idol. In 1995, a London magazine voted him the fifth most fanciable male of the year. The surprise was that there were four ahead of him. Sorry, Davy, you weren't one of them. And then the love letters started to pour in. Certainly on Valentine's Day, the house would get a sack of Valentine's cards. And I think William received a lot of mail from all around the world, people, all the time. I mean, the other side of the world. Just uh, 
people write to him for no reason, really. <laughs> and they'll send photos and all sorts. William has, for years, attracted constant female attention. As he grows into the world's most eligible bachelor, interest in his romantic life just keeps intensifying. Tomorrow. Ever wonder what it really takes to create... Hey, as in wireless, we never stop working for you. Mark and Karen have twit on a and &E. Are you back? Are you comfy? Good. Because Meet the Royals is ready with more here on A&E. March 1997, William's confirmation. Charles and Diana made another awkward appearance together. Since the separation, Diana had developed a strong, some said overly dependent, relationship with her eldest son. Diana reportedly talked to William about her love life and asked him for advice on everything from boyfriends to charity work. Many people thought that Diana used William as her crutch, but I don't believe that. But she often gave William credit for things, and certainly when she put her dresses up for sale in Christie's in New York, she gives William the credit for that idea. And William became increasingly protective of his mother as she was continually besieged by paparazzi trying to photograph her every move. You'd have photographers on motorbikes with walkie-talkies and things outside Kensington Palace. And as soon as she moved out with the children or on her own, she would be followed wherever she was going, shopping, to the gym, whatever. And the pressure began to build up. And William saw his mother being chased down the street. I mean, he witnessed her horror and her fear and her loathing of, of being followed all the time. So it must have affected him. As pressure built, Diana fled London frequently. The owner of Harrods Department Store, an old family friend named Muhammad Al-Fayed, suggested that she and the boys join his family on a holiday in the south of France. I said, come with me, no problem, you're most welcome. She checked with her sons, they loved the idea, arranged everything for them. Diana and the princes stayed in the Al-Fayed's villa in Saint-Tropez. It was on this holiday that Diana and Mr. Al-Fayed's son, Dodi, became close and later started dating. William and Harry went jet skiing and scuba diving off the Al-Fayed's luxury yacht. And after the holiday, William sent a warm letter of thanks. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Al-Fayed, thank you both so much for such an enjoyable week in France. I cannot tell you how much I loved it. And I am now very much looking forward to using my Harris card. I hope you have a great time in Finland. Love, William. After that, the princes went up to Scotland to stay with their father, but the holiday soon came to a sudden shocking end. On a Sunday morning in August 1997, William and Harry were woken and told that their mother was dead. She had been killed in a car crash as she and Dodi Al-Fayed were being driven through the streets of Paris, followed by paparazzi. At Kensington Palace, the princes were met with an unprecedented wave of sympathy. William, William. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, God. Thank you very much. Thank you. When they looked at the tributes to their mother, and there were thousands and thousands, and there were people there and, uh, and talking to them, and how they never broke down in tears, I'll never know. Oh, God. And I think it tells us a lot about William in his future life, that when he wants to get his emotions under control, he can. At the funeral, the composure of William and Harry impressed the world. The sight of these two boys, only 15 and 12, who suddenly lost the mother they adored was deeply affecting.
Westminster Abbey, Diana's brother Earl Spencer criticized the royal family for the way they treated his sister and made a promise to her memory. I pledge that we, your blood family, will do all we can to continue the imaginative and loving way in which you are steering these two exceptional young men, so that their souls are not simply immersed by duty and tradition, but can sing openly as you planned. William showed little emotion in public. I was a little bit concerned that he may be too introspective and that he was storing up too many problems for himself in later life, that he wasn't letting it all out, that he wasn't grieving enough. William did say that his world had fallen apart after his mother's death. The hostility he already felt towards the press was exacerbated by the fact that the paparazzi were chasing Diana when she died. He must blame the photographers to some extent to being involved in her death, and I just can't see how he can ever separate it and how he can ever really, ever really feel at ease or happy with the press again. Immediately after his mother's death, the press agreed to leave Prince William alone. He returned to school a week after the funeral and was allowed to grieve in private. For the remainder of his time there, Eton was a haven for William. One day it happened to be, we came back from lessons and uh, William was walking on the side and we, there was a big crowd of tourists outside the house and walked straight through the middle and not one of them recognized him. And they all, you know, it happened a lot. There was little recognition. People couldn't see who he was. Diana's death didn't mean the end of the turmoil between her and the royal family. Many see William as a bridge between the two opposing sides. We might see William almost having a, a sort of healing effect. There is still an element out there who are very quick to take sides. The so-called War of the Waleses. In a way, he represents the end of that. William's first 21 years have been tumultuous ones, but they have started to shape him into the man who will be king. Hi there, I'm Liz West, inviting you to join me. Direct.com today. A&D Home Video proudly offers the program you're watching on VHS for only $24.95 plus shipping and handling. To order, call 1-800-423-1212 or visit AETV.com. So, you want to be a princess? Well, here's an easy way to do it. You marry a prince. Now, if you've got your sights set on wills here, you've got to play by the rules. Rule number one? You can't be a Catholic. Yeah, yeah, I know. A 300-year-old English law rears its ugly head. Rule number two. If you're divorced, your ex has to be dead, passed on, kaput. You get the idea? Now, rule three. You need permission from the Queen and also Parliament. Thank bad old King George III for that law put through after two of his brothers made secret marriages to disreputable commoners. I hate it when that happens. In 1964, the Beatles arrived in America to crowds of screaming girls. More than 30 years later, in 1998, another British invasion had a similar effect. This time, it was Prince William headed for a vacation in Canada. There was thousands of young girls and they were it was like the Beatles in the 60s they were hysterical they were screaming for him and of course Harry was winding him up saying oh William look one over there one over there the police were having to rugby tackle young teenage girls who were clambering over crowd barriers saying marry me marry me there were tens of thousands tens of thousands of girls on rooftops and people climbing up lampposts he coped brilliantly he put his head up if, and he and he just talked to them and he took the flowers and he was and he and he and he accepted uh, his role and I thought that was the start of the new William as far as I was concerned nearly a 
year after his mother's death, William was coming into his own and gaining worldwide recognition as a bona fide babe. On his 16th birthday, he gave his first official interview. I was asked to submit written questions, and it was quite clear early on that the parameters would be quite narrow. There were some things which William didn't want to talk about. He didn't want to talk about his feelings after the death of his mother. As for the screaming fans, he said politely that he wasn't really comfortable with the adulation of teenage girls. Yeah, yeah, I used to lie like that when I was his age, too. In any case, the press was obsessed with spotting potential matches for William. At the formal Cartier Polo lunch in July 1999, they thought they had one. I attended the Cartier Polo with my girlfriend, Alexander, which is a great day out. It's a great lunch, and I was expecting to be um, sitting with her, but um, I was told that we'd be sitting on two different tables, and she was probably taken to Prince William's table. And um, the next day, on the front page of every single newspaper, was a picture of um, my girlfriend being the, the new hot date for Prince William. Later that summer, the press had another chance to catch William with a girl at his side when the teenage heartthrob jetted off for a cruise around the Greek islands with a bevy of well-bred girls. Prince Charles let him take some of his friends, girlfriends as well, and they had great parties. I remember one time they, they went ashore and they the, the local tavern o owner uh, employed a belly dancer for them, and so, you know, he's certainly getting his eyes open to the ways of the world. Well, and of course, we all want to know who's the lucky lady. He's very handsome. He's constantly surrounded by gorgeous young girls, and that suits him fine, because <laughs> not only does he love the company of women, but he, uh, if he has a special girl that he really likes, she can get lost in the crowd and no one's going to know who it is. So he, he sees safety in numbers. Soon as he is spotted with a, a good-looking girl on his arm, probably a blonde in his case, um, there'll be a media f feeding frenzy. And of course, he isn't going to like that. One of William's other hobbies has already attracted just the sort of media attention he hates. While debate was raging in the UK over whether or not fox hunting should be banned, William was filmed going out with the Beaufort hunt. Diana had been dismayed with her son's love of hunting, but neither a nagging mother nor a nagging press could keep him away. He made his mind up and some call him willful wills. You know, once he's made his mind up, it's difficult to change him. William has since faced the media on more sensitive subjects, like his mother's memory. Just days after a newspaper had started serializing Shadows of a Princess, the tell-all book by Diana's former private secretary, William answered journalists' questions on the subject. Well, of course, um, Harry and I are both quite obsessed about it that our mother's trust has been betrayed and that um, even now she's still being exploited. But um, I don't really want to say any more on that. I have great sympathy for Prince William's feelings, but I also know that his mother is a public figure and always will be and will be written about for years to come. I think that what will be far more helpful for him over time, I hope, is to read an accurate account of the eight years that I spent with his mother and that way, I hope, grow in understanding of how she achieved as much as she did. Diana, years after her death, is still a public figure. An interest in the son who looks so much like her has only intensified. William is still extremely wary of the media and hoped to keep them at arm's length during college. He chose to attend St. Andrews, tucked away in a relatively remote part of Scotland and far away from the London paparazzi. The atmosphere of St. Andrews is very, uh, very, very much a sense of community. Uh, it's a tremendously small place and there's a sense of belonging here that perhaps you don't get at the larger metropolitan universities. But St. Andrews' remote location wasn't enough to keep the crowds away on his first day. Prince William, how are you looking forward to your first term? Looking forward to your term? 
Attention died down after that, and two years into school, William has settled into college life, studying art history. Now, people are starting to wonder about Will's life after college, and rumors are flying. I suspect he will probably travel. He loves the wide open spaces of, of Africa, and I think he probably will go back there. He might possibly come and do a business course uh, in America. Um, he might go into the army, but he's not saying which, but I think he'll probably do all three. I think he will spend some time in the forces, he will travel, and I, I think he would very much like to come to America. Diana always said, and she told me herself, how much the boys loved America. Meanwhile, William is not shirking his royal duties. As he turns 21, he's making more and more formal appearances and popping up in papers around the globe. And while the royal image makers may not have been pleased with this appearance in the National Enquirer, his family is trying to ease him into the spotlight under the watchful eye of his father. His father's main role in life is to make William into a good king. I mean, Prince Charles, when he's king, will only be king for a short time. And I think he knows that he's got to turn William into a, into a great monarch. When William was about 15, he said to his mother, I don't want to be king. And she told everyone, she told me, she said, you know, William doesn't want to be king. Harry wants to be king. He said, William, it doesn't matter if you don't want to be king, I will be. And when William gave an interview for his 21st birthday, he was savvy enough to point out that, that he didn't necessarily want to be king, but he knew he would have to be king, and therefore he was going to take his duties very seriously. I think that with the prospect of this glamorous young man striding forth before us into our newspapers, uh, we are going to be looking with optimism to the future of the British royal family. Well, Wills, it's decision time, eh? Hey, maybe you should come over to the States and star in a TV show. Well, it worked for me. This is Davy Jones. Whatever our young William does, you can be sure to find out all about it on Meet the Royals. Tomorrow. Ever wonder what it really takes to create a soap? Well, first stop the writers, then it's into production, onto set, off to edit, not forgetting the sound mix. Whew. All this, all in one day, to make one more episode. And we do 260 shows a year. Of All My Children, on an all-new biography. Premieres tomorrow night at 8 on A&E.